the panel could come up and take their seats on the stage, we can get ready to begin to take some questions. Um, I will begin with a couple of questions, and then the audience here at Beckman Auditorium will have the opportunity to ask a couple of questions, and to do that, you should go to a microphone. And also, for all the viewers online, you may ask questions too. There's two good places to do that. One is in the chat on the Ustream broadcast, and the other is on Twitter using the hashtag ICSeries. So go ahead and queue up your questions, but uh, I will begin. Um, looking at the mission representatives on this panel, I counted and I think that they're responsible for the exploration of 12 previously unexplored worlds in the solar system. Um, Dante's mission is exploring a single one, Bennu, and then uh, Rosetta is uh, responsible for churyumov gerasimenka Steins, and Lutetia, which are both asteroids. We have uh, Don going to Vesta and Ceres, and then Alan with Pluto, Sharon, Nix, Styx, Hydra, and Kerberos. Kerberos, thank you. And if Jim is very generous to the mission, they hopefully will have the opportunity to explore another Kuiper Belt object beyond that. So my question for you, and we'll begin with Alan on this one, is do all of these worlds have anything to do with each other other than the fact that they're all smaller than Mercury? Or is it just an accident that we're talking them about at the same time because of their size? Uh, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, they, there's a bit of an accident in, in that they're all arriving at uh, you know the, the late 20 teens, but they do have something to do with each other, in that uh, these small planets and also the um, uh, the asteroids that we're talking about all contain uh, important information about the formation of our solar system. Um, the 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 way that we understand that planets are built is from the bottom up, and Mark Raymond spoke about this, starting with dust grains that grow to rocks and rocks that grow to boulders boulders that grow to a small asteroid and comet-sized um, objects, and then protoplanets, uh, and then somewhat larger bodies like Pluto, and so forth. And so there's a spectrum, if you will, that can, by connecting the dots, teach us about the accretion process, and also teach us about the way that um, some common features that we're all very interested in, that you heard about uh, in the last uh, several talks, um, come to be. You know, it turns out that most of the oceans in our solar system are probably on the inside of worlds. Only the Earth apparently wears its oceans on the outside. And most of the oceans in our solar system are apparently on small planets and, and uh, objects like Ceres and Pluto, perhaps Charon, uh, that you've been hearing about. So some really interesting ties between these different types of objects and some very important ones. And does anybody else want to chime in on, on that particular question? Uh, I'll, I'll add to it a little bit, Emily. So one of the other things that, that we do to connect, we heard Carol talking about these large impacts that have sculpted Vesta and Ceres, and Bennu is a fragment from one of those. So we're looking at uh, how something not only went through something like what Vesta experienced, but even more catastrophic, where the entire asteroid was shattered, disrupted into thousands and thousands of fragments. So we're interested in going back to the origins and the, and the early history of the solar system, but we're also trying to understand how these bodies have been modified throughout solar system history, how you can completely destroy a large asteroid and have it fragment into many thousands of things which end up tumbling into the inner solar system. So we're seeking very similar recent processes as well. I, I would just add that um, in some cases for Rosetta, it took nearly 30 years to get the mission the, ex the size of it with all the instruments to lay the groundwork in Europe, to, lay the, to get all the, uh, uh, the space agency to sign up to it. In some cases, it took much shorter uh, amount of time to get the, the mission ready to go and to actually get it there. Um, New Horizons, you know, was the fastest mission ever. Um, uh, and I can't remember how many minutes it took to get to the moon, but um, some <laughs> incredibly short amount of time. So it's ironic that we're all here pretty much at the same time, but we're all basically after the same uh, basic pieces of the dawn of the solar system. So it, it is um, a wonderful time for all of us. So from my perspective, you know, they are related in the sense that they all came from the initial collapsing cloud. And where they formed and where they are today may be a completely different location. And so that's the really exciting thing about finding out what those connections are all about. All right. Yeah, um, and actually, um, just Go ahead. one uh, last uh, point. <laughs> uh, one of the 
things that we can also learn by studying these bodies in the main belt, um, you know, th throughout the, the solar system is the um, impact record. And the impact record tells you how many um, things there were um, flying around the solar system between the inner to the outer and, and, and vice versa. And that helps us to understand the dynamical evolution of the bodies in the solar system. And there's been a tremendous amount of progress recently in models that attempt to explain um, the positions of the planets and the um, amount of material in the main belt. Um, and, and we now know that there's likely to have been um, quite a bit of exchange of material between the inner and outer solar system. And so some of those objects in the Kuiper belt that Alan talked about may have originated in the, uh, in the main belt or, or even the inner solar system and, and vice versa. So um, it's a tremendously exciting time when you know, computer modeling has become so sophisticated and powerful and we're out there collecting the kinds of data needed to really um, you know, uh, um, pin these models down. So I think we're really on the verge of, of uh, much greater understanding of, of what went on in the early solar system. So my next question is for uh, Dante and Carol. You're both representing missions to asteroids for which we will eventually, we hope, have samples on Earth. In the case of Vesta, we have a lot of material, and I'd like to know how much material there is compared to how much uh, OSIRIS-REx is going to return, and what are the, um, the benefits and compromises that we have from having material that arrived accidentally compared to material that we went out to collect? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I don't actually know what it is in kilograms, but um, we about 20% um, of, or, sorry, about one in 20 of the meteorites that fall to the Earth um, come from Vesta, and there's more uh, Vesta material in our meteorite collections as there is for the Moon and the Mars com and Mars combined. So it's a tremendous amount of material, and um, it's been studied extensively in labs since it was, uh, it, you know, both for its for its for its own merits, but also because it it was. Um, associated with Vesta, and, and therefore we had um, a, a bit more motivation to, to understand it. So um, that meteorite collection told us that the, um, the body had melted and formed a basaltic crust, but also um, there was material in that collection, um, clasts of, of dark, carbonaceous, rich material that people basically said, yeah, you know, that there's, there's a little bit of contamination, we would expect that, but it turned out um, that is the exact material that we believe was the result, what was the cause of this um, eruption of, um, of, of gases off of Vesta from, from the cratering that I talked about, and, and also the fact that we, we see um, a, hydro, a concentration of hydrogen on the surface, which is much higher. So this isn't just a, a, a little bit of contamination, this is like, a, a pretty major contribution to the outer surface of Vesta, a veneer, and this is the same kind of um, veneer we would have expected on the inner planets, and so it did deliver quite a bit of water. So I, I kind of wandered a little bit off the topic there, but I, I just wanted to to um, to emphasize this facet of you know the Dante's mission is going to uh, to look at, at this material in detail, um, and we're starting to draw, you know, to, to be able to um, connect the dots between um, how these different bodies interacted and, um, and what the results are. And so Vesta provided this wonderful um, way to, to do a reverse sample return mission and, and really try to understand a body in detail when we already knew so much about its, um, it, its, its material. Yeah, and I, and I would say you actually didn't wander off topic because I think what you talked about and what's critical for sample return is the geologic context. So we had the samples of Vesta and we were pretty sure that's where they came from because the spectral match was so good and it was the only example where we could really say, here's an asteroid, here's a group of meteorites and their spectra are really good matches for each other so we have high confidence they're from Vesta. But Don nailed it, said yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. These are coming from Vesta. And not only that, but you saw the, the different terrains on the surface of the asteroid. We know where the Diogenites are likely coming from. We know where the, what the Eucrites represent. And we know where these carbonaceous clasts now and what they represent. So the ability to understand those samples has grown enormously because we have these great geologic maps of the asteroid where they come from. 
In the case of the carbonaceous chondrites, first of all, there's, there's a lot less of them, especially these really rare, friable, fragile, organic rich materials. Uh, you know, we only have a few kilograms of them on Earth right now. And we can't match uh, the spectra of Bennu to anything in our collection. Mm -hmm. So we think we're really going for something that's different, either because it's been modified by exposure to the space environment, and so we've got this space weathering that's changing what organic material looks like on the surface of the asteroids, or it's such a fragile type of material, it doesn't survive the passage through the Earth's atmosphere that uh, is required. You, get, you have a selection effect on what makes it to the surface of the Earth, because it's a violent event. Uh, and the other thing is, we're really going after organic material we think is the precursor to biomolecules. And we want to understand the amino acids, and we want to understand the nucleic acids, and how they originated and evolved on these small bodies in the inner solar system. And we do a lot of that by proxy. We study amino acids and carbonaceous chondrites today, but we intentionally study the ones that aren't used in biology, uh, because we can we can't be certain those weren't contaminated by bacteria, which are all over the meteorites. The meteorites are picked up usually in an uncontrolled way. They've sat on the surface of the Earth for a long time. And the nucleic acids are even tougher. The amino acids is a wide range of chemical compounds. And so you can find some that aren't used in biology. The nucleic acids are much more challenging. Did the components of DNA come from these meteorites or not? And I compare it to a forensic investigation. We will control the chain of evidence from the moment it left the asteroid surface to the moment it got into our mass spectrometers, and we will know exactly what was introduced, if anything, into those samples, and so we'll have very clean, very strong science results. You know, um, this accretion process actually is a violent one. It requires bodies uh, hitting each other, uh, blowing up apart into pieces, and then uh, accreting and coming back together. And it's the remaining pieces that flow through our solar system. And in fact, 100 tons of that material fall into the atmosphere every day. NASA has a program of collecting uh, meteorites uh, that are these bits and pieces that uh, we try to use to then uh, figure out where they came from and try to understand the, the initial chemistry of the solar system and how that evolves over time. We go to the Antarctica and uh, uh, every summer, uh, we go out onto the ice sheet and we'll collect anywhere from 600 to 900 meteorites and bring them back and then classify them and try to understand them. Sometimes we get lucky. They're from Mars. Sometimes they're carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, mostly they're stonies. They can be irons. They can be just a whole variety of exciting things. And, and that's f informing us of what is happening out in the solar system. But it's really our missions that go there that examine these pieces that enable us to connect that record and to understand what's happening in our solar system and how it's evolved. OK, and this will be my last question before I throw it to the audience. Uh, so beginning for, for Claudia, um, so many of uh, scientists these days are so excited about plumes on Enceladus, and maybe they're on Europa. But your comet has all kinds of plumes. Comets <laughs> are full of plumes. So I want to know, what's the difference between those and the things that we're excited about on Enceladus and Ceres? And at the end, I want to know if Alan predicts to find plumes on Pluto. <laughs> So um, I think uh, it's, it's all a matter of what's the actual, how much mass is actually coming out. Uh, um, I, Enceladus, the plumes seem to have more chunky, icy stuff. Uh, that I, that's probably not, it's not 100% of what's coming out because the spacecraft did agree to fly through it. Uh, but it, it does have you know, bits of very salty stuff, uh, dust grains. Uh, in the Enceladus plumes. And it's not clear with comets how much mass is actually coming out of these things and why are they, why do they look collimated? Okay, why do they look like jets that are going in a particular direction? So we, this, this is an actually active topic on the, on the project right now. Are, are we, do we, do we need to change the name of what we are calling these things? Is it, is jet the right name? Because there may not be that much mass there, but you may be seeing something that is reflecting sunlight differently based on where the location is uh, that, that they're coming out. So they look, obviously, to the naked eye, like there's some sort of collimation effect. Or it may be that the ground that they're coming out of uh, um, has some sort of forcing effect, and we have not made any sort of correlation between the topography and, and what is uh, causing this the beam-like look of the jet-like plumes. 
Um, but this is, you know, something that we're very, very interested in understanding. I think there's another distinction. Uh, when, you, when we talk about Enceladus and we talk about Europa and we see these plumes, uh, the implication is it started from a water reserve, you know, some under the crust ocean or lake, some, something where that water is started. However, on a comet, we don't believe there's any liquid in that form, uh, but it is frozen ices. Uh, so um, then there's a sublimation process, and as Claudia says, uh, how that forms a discrete jet is, uh, is still yet to be found. So I'll answer Emily's uh, question. She put the bait out there. I would, I would say that I don't make predictions, but I wouldn't bet against plumes on Pluto. But I think even more interesting, we have two very, very tantalizing lines of evidence that Pluto's big moon, Charon, about uh, a third wider than Ceres, may itself have surface activity. We see crystalline water ice in the spectra, and the crystallinity um, is the key here. Crystalline water ice can't survive over geologic time because radiation attacks the surface, and when you uh, put space radiation onto crystalline water ice in a laboratory, you find it breaks down very quickly. So the presence of the crystalline water ice is evidence that that water ice has recently been emplaced. So there's some active process that's putting it there. And then even more interesting, perhaps, is that we find ammonium hydrates that are often the result of things that come out of um, cryovolcanoes, cryovolca also on Sharon's surface. So we have two independent lines of evidence that are pointing to Sharon as a rising star with the possibility of activity. And New Horizons, which is represented by this little model, um, has just the right instrumentation on board in terms of infrared composition, mapping spectrometers, in terms of an ultraviolet spectrometer to look for an atmosphere around Sharon, and high resolution geologic mapping instruments to determine whether or not Sharon is active as many geophysicists think. And we will let you know very soon. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was remiss in poking Carol to tell us if those white spots on Ceres are plumes or not. <laughs> yeah, so um, interestingly, the Herschel Space Observatory um, looked at Ceres as a space-based um, telescope that um, can view a certain uh, water vapor band. And when Ceres was passing closest to the sun, um, over uh, the last few years, the Herschel Space Observatory detected water vapor in, in the vicinity of Ceres. And this um, had been suggested back in the, um, in the 80s based on a different set of observations, but it, um, it was, it was a, there was no um, confirmation. So now we have a fairly um, firm um, detection of water vapor around Ceres. And the exact longitudes um, where the water vapors seem to be concentrated include the longitudes where we see those very bright spots in that one crater. So it begs the question of whether there is um, an active process ongoing or um, one that's uh, very short um, in the very recent past um, that has uh, sent the, the water vapor um, into a tenuous atmosphere around Ceres and possibly left behind uh, salt deposit or even um, exposed some ice in the surface. So those are, um, we're able to link some, you know, some other telescopic observations to what, what we're observing on the surface and build a much richer um, story about the history of, of what the activity level on Ceres is. And our, our job is really to, um, to make sure that we can um, connect all this evidence together in a, in a very um, confident story. I like how careful you are, Carol. Okay, I'll go ahead and take the first question from the audience. Please speak into the microphone so that the viewers online can hear you. Hi, I had a, a quick question about the Southern Impact Basin on Vesta uh, and a couple of relations to that. Um, first, uh, the impactor that nailed it obviously had to be considerable. Do, do, are the equatorial corrugations basically frozen shock waves from elasticized material? And, uh, and then do we were able to kind of estimate or guess what uh, the impactor was and where it ended up? Do we still know if it's cruising around the asteroid belt? And uh, is there any guesses on, on that? So um, 
So modeling has shown that the impactor that created that Rea Silvia basin was likely around 60 kilometers in size, and, and it would have, it, that was its demise when it hit Vesta. Um, the, the, the cracks are, are basically just tensional features, that, so the, the crust um, opened up into troughs, so similar to you know, the basins that you see across the basin and range of the, the western United States. They're just um, fault-bounded basins that are now uh, full of ejecta, but you still see this topography of them. So, so essentially, the, when the, um, the, the shock waves went through, in some places they, they compact the surface and they crush the, material, the porosity of the material and, and, and make it more dense, and in other places um, they, they create um, voids and openings. And, and in this case, we had these just beautiful uh, macro features of, of, of tensional cracks on the surface. And, and modeling has, has been able to, um, to demonstrate that this would be expected for such an impact. So where the material went is uh, the ejecta that was liberated from that impact spread over the entire southern hemisphere of Vesta. And um, it, essentially, you know, the, the whole half of the body is covered with this um, very um, fine uh, ejecta material. Go ahead. Uh, you were next, I think. Okay. Um, this is, I guess, really for Alan Stern primarily, but others can weigh in. In the outer solar system, I'm not aware of any missions planned or not very many proposals going past Jupiter and Cassini is about to die or be end of life, and of course you're going to go by Pluto. So what do you think we should do next in the outer solar system? I mean, it takes a long time to get there, so it seems like we should be some, thinking of something now <laughs> if we're not going to have a very long gap. Um, you know, sort of out beyond Jupiter. Yeah, I'll answer, uh, just as a scientist, uh, uh, my own opinions, and Jim might want to chip in on this as well, or others. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, the outer solar system really is a wonderland with targets like Enceladus and Europa and, and Titan, uh, the gas giants, uh, the ice giants, and then the wonderland of the Kuiper Belt with, you know, a whole collection of small planets which are very diverse. When we look around the small planets of the Kuiper Belt, they have different colors. Some have atmospheres and some don't. Some have satellites and some don't. So there's, there's a lot to do and there's a lot of interest in the scientific community in doing those things. You're right that because it takes longer, um, it's somewhat harder uh, uh, than uh, uh, convincing people to do sh shorter missions to closer targets. But NASA is undertaking a whole series of missions to the Jupiter system with both astrobiological as well as uh, planetary formation um, rationale behind them. Uh, there's a mission that's about to arrive at Jupiter called Juno in 2016 and just begin its explorations of the interior of Jupiter and the magnetosphere. Uh, NASA is looking very hard at a Europa mission uh, that has uh, very exciting science behind it. And NASA is studying other missions uh, that are possible uh, and recommended by the decadal surveys into the deep outer solar system. I'm personally very interested in, um, in whether the results from New Horizons will create a groundswell of interest in new missions to the Kuiper Belt. But I think we have to get the results first in order to really see how that priority uh, falls out in the scientific community. Yeah, Alan's exactly right. Uh, the flyby, as I mentioned um, earlier uh, today, is the first reconnaissance that we do of a new environment uh, and, and the Pluto system and into the Kuiper belt is just that first foray. And, and then it's from that that we then step back and we decide, hey, this is really exciting. These are the next steps we want to do. Perhaps we want to go back uh, in the next decade uh, with an orbiter in the Pluto system. I'm sure Alan would enjoy that. I think I would <laughs> already, based on what we're seeing already from, uh, from New Horizons. Really exciting stuff. But indeed, um, uh, we have a series of missions in front of us that we're trying to develop. One is we're moving towards a Europa mission. Uh, Europa's been uh, just a fabulous body to study. Under its crust, ice crust, we believe there's um, twice the amount of water under that crust in an ocean form than there is here on the Earth. Uh, and it's uh, existed that way for four and a half billion years. It's had uh, perhaps organics. It's, uh, it's been heated by tidal forces from Jupiter. Perfect, perfect perhaps for an abode of, of, of a water life. So very exciting, uh, uh, that particular mission. We're working with the European Space Agency right now on a mission called JUICE, 
which is the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer system. It's going to uh, primarily look at the very large moon, our largest moon in the solar system called Ganymede, which we now have determined has indeed uh, an ocean much deeper uh, under its ice crust than, than Europa, but still another uh, fabulous, fabulous body. What we're finding out over the last several years is that there is a slew of icy bodies, icy worlds, and ocean worlds uh, that are intermixed in our outer solar system. Those we, we, we believe we really need to study. The solar system has really gotten to be a very soggy place. Now, why is that important? It's important because life requires water, at least the life that we know. And so it really bodes well for us to be able to, to go on to a search for life beyond Earth. And I, and I would add one thing that um, Juno was a real pathfinder in many ways because it showed that you could do a solar powered mission to the Jupiter system at least. And I know there's a discovery uh, opportunity out right now. A lot of my friends and colleagues have proposed to that. And there are outer solar system missions in that mix. I mean, you never know where that's going to land because it's a competitive mission that's driven by the quality of the science and the readiness of the technology. But Juno really opened a lot of people's eyes and say, hey, we don't need to wait for the plutonium to pile up before we can think about getting out to do some outer solar system missions. So there's some exciting ideas in the community even right now. So I'm gonna take questions from the four people who are currently standing at the microphone and then I'll move into questions from online. So if you could please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, what do you plan to do with the, with the spacecraft after the Dawn and New Horizons missions? Yes, uh, so Dawn is going to be a permanent visitor at Ceres. It is going to remain in its lowest orbit where um, it's about 375 meters above the surface. And um, it will just keep on orbiting for 50, 100 years or beyond. And what will happen is that when we run out of fuel, we can't um, maintain the spacecraft to be pointing in a certain direction. And therefore, the solar panels won't be pointed at the sun and we'll lose power. And so the spacecraft will just start tumbling. We won't be able to communicate with it, so we won't be able to, to use the, the scientific instrumentation. But the spacecraft itself um, is just going to be just fine. It's just going to keep you know, orbiting around Ceres. Well, it's a very different story with New Horizons. It's a very fast mission. It's been traveling very fast, and it's just going to fly past the Pluto system. And after it concludes its studies, uh, and transmits all the data. Um, we're in the very fortunate position that the spacecraft is healthy. It's not using any of the backup systems. Uh, it's full of fuel, and it's capable of communicating and being powered for decades to come. So we have some possibilities that we can propose to NASA. Um, probably the one that you may know about is that um, we have some targets to fly by much smaller objects, the building blocks of small planets like Pluto. These are targets that are a billion miles farther than Pluto in the Kuiper Belt uh, for arrival dates in 2019. They are about a thousand times as massive as Rosetta's comet that we're orbiting today with Rosetta and a thousand times less massive than Pluto. So that's a nice sweet spot right in the middle for studying those kinds of processes like accretion. We also have the possibility after that, because that's only in 2019, of proposing to go even farther for one target um, almost all of our fuel will be gone if we chose that one. But for the other, we would still have enough fuel to look for yet one more flyby target or to operate the spacecraft like Voyager very far out into interstellar space. And we have much more sophisticated instrumentation than Voyager because our instrumentation was built with 2000s technology instead of 1970s technology. So my team has a homework assignment next mm -hmm. year after Pluto uh, to write a proposal to NASA and then NASA can decide whether we do uh, one or the other or both of those missions that I talked about or, or whether we don't. Mm -hmm. So next please. Um, I was wondering on Vesta, when seeing the pictures of it, there's a lot of impact craters, but then there's these lines that look like someone took a fingernail and scraped it around. And I wondered where those came from. Uh, so those are the troughs um, that were created by the large impacts themselves. So um, the, the material, the, 
when, when the um, crater formed, a lot of material uh, um, was lofted off the mm -hmm. surface, but also shock waves um, went through the entire body. And they um, get focused, um, and pr in particular by the fact that Vesta has an iron core. Um, those waves uh, interfere sometimes, so sometimes they're creating compression and sometimes they create extension. And so um, at, at the, basically at the equator of the impact point, um, it, it caused the opening of these cracks on the surface. And, and we're uh, confident about that interpretation because we not only see them around the Rea Silvia Basin, but that older Venonea Basin, which is underneath it, um, is, is, does not have the same impact point. And so you can draw a circle around its impact point and you see another set of these um, troughs that are older. So it, it all um, makes, yes. makes sense. Interesting, thank you. Okay, over on this side. Can you take it off? <laughs> right. So um, I guess the question is primarily to Claudia regarding the um, Rosetta and its comet. And you mentioned during the presentation that the discovery from that mission makes you guys think and all the scientists in the world think that Earth water did not come from comet. And as far as I understand, that refers to the discovery of D2H ratio, D2 to hydrogen ratio, is that correct? Correct. Which is, what, twice uh, that on Earth, right? And um, in regards to this deuterium to hydrogen ratio, uh, when people study that on Mars and they find, what, six and 10 in some places, that is interpreted as an indication of atmospheric loss, um, where in the process of that loss, hydrogen and hydrogen-containing water is going faster than deuterium and deuterium-containing water. The comets obviously lose stuff all the time, and I was wondering how much this material lost from the comet um, affects the D2H ratio that is found on the comet now, as opposed to the initial formation. Uh, the D2H ratio is kind of fixed from the from the Big Bang, basically. It's, 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 uh, it's, that's where it got set. And then when you can have atmospheric processes like on Mars that can preferentially uh, uh, segregate uh, the lighter from the heavier components. But, um, so first of all, let me say that we know at, uh, Kuiper Belt, we thought perhaps Kuiper Belt comets were the ones bringing the water to the Earth because Oort cloud comets already did not have the right D to H ratios. Okay, so I wanna be clear that um, now we have to rethink the role of Kuiper Belt objects and also rethink this scattering event. Carol talked about new ideas are coming to the front about the movement of the various planets while the, uh, of the, while the cloud was collapsing. So we have a lot of rethinking to do about the, what the measurement means. So your question is actually, um, does that same atmospheric process at Mars, is that at perhaps work on the comet itself? Um, and I think that what we're kind of waiting for is to find out if the measurement actually changes, right? Uh, Rosetta took that measurement right before orbit insertion, uh, and so we're kind of waiting to see if it stays the same, because then we would, we would be looking at, uh, looking at what dynamics, kind of a process guess, would right? that mean, yeah. And I'll follow on. I did some experiments with a colleague at University of Arizona, Bob Brown, where we looked at this very process, and we do see a lot of change in the D to H ratio from sublimating ice under cometary conditions uh, over time scales of days to weeks. So I think Claudia is right. You really need to look at the time variation in the coma. Uh, and we also saw the deuterium would form a very tightly bound kind of a lag deposit until it got so diffuse what we call the fairy castle structure, and we saw the spectrally, the whole layer would break away and see a very large D to H spike in the sample. So there is isotopic fractionation going on in sublimation of ice, and so these point measurements can be a little uh, hard to interpret because it's a dynamic system that's sublimating and isotopic fractionation is intrinsic in that process. So at the end of the day, it might happen that Earth water did come from the comets, right? It's just we're measuring it currently at the wrong time. Right, and, and just to, uh, you know, to think about the future, one way to really address that is comet sample return, and it's a very high priority mission in the decadal survey. Get samples yes, back from yes. the surface in our laboratories where we can pick it apart ion by ion and really see what's going on there. Okay, I'll take two more questions from the audience and then go to online, so please go ahead. 
Yes, like the uh, song says, the desert's an ocean with the sea underground. And uh, you pointed out that Earth is, is perhaps uh, an exception, having the, the ocean on its surface and much of the rest of the, the planetary and, and uh, smaller object systems have submerged seas. What, you touched on one of those proposals for, for examination of that, but what uh, proposals are in the pipeline for either exploring those submerged oceans from the surface or the penetrator concepts of actually looking at the material that, that is in those submerged oceans and where do those proposals stand at this point? I'll speak to a couple of them and then others may want to want to elaborate. Um, uh, the Europa mission that we spoke to a little bit earlier, you know, is, is uh, directly targeted to study material from uh, that ocean and to better understand the depth and volume of the ocean, the chemistry that's going on inside, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, uh, that's a mission that's, that's on the heels of uh, turning into a real development project now. Jim probably knows a lot more about this and can say, say more about it. And, and there's even discussion in the study stage that that, that mission could involve um, a lander concept to go with it, and Jim could speak to whether that's very realistic or not. But in addition, there had been a great deal of work uh, uh, looking at uh, missions that could go and sample the plumes of what we think is ocean material coming out of Enceladus and return that sample to the Earth as well. And those are pretty mature in terms of proposal concept, but they're not uh, they haven't been successful yet in being selected for new starts. Now, the game changes in planetary science. That's one of the exciting things about being in this field. We learn new things and priorities can shift. So if, for example, we find that the dawn discovers that Ceres has or had an ocean or has internal activity that brings material up to the surface, if those plumes are real, then that's a, that's a target that may rise in terms of uh, our wanting to study a very nearby interior ocean that really wasn't on our radar even a few years ago, mm -hmm. but new data teaches us new things and priorities change. Yeah, indeed, Alan's right. Right now our study of Europa is mature enough that uh, we're going to uh, move it towards what we call a key decision point <coughs> in June. If that all works out, uh, we'll then begin the process of developing the mission for real. Now, in addition to that, and this would be this would be multiple flybys that really create a global understanding of what that body is all about. So that's uh, that's that second stage. You know, flyby as we've done with Galileo. Now we want to really get a global view of it that we do with the next mission. Well, we we'll also have to look at you know the potential findings that we would get from that mission and whether we could get down to the ground or it, or even into the ocean. And right now, the concepts that are being considered are. Um, a um, soft lander, a rough lander, something that hits, bounces maybe a little bit, or even a penetrator, something that, that goes right after uh, impacting the ice and then making some key measurements as it, uh, as it uh, has a short lifetime. So um, uh, we're not going to have missions unless we study them, and so these indeed are the next set of things that we're going to take a careful look at. So first order business in the foreseeable future would be uh, surface, if, if we're looking at samples, would be surface ejecta rather than penetrators trying to reach down to, to submerged oceans. Yeah, in fact, from the Hubble observations, we believe um, that there may be plumes like Enceladus coming out of uh, cracks at Europa. This is wonderful because that just gives us the ocean right up front that we hopefully could uh, go by, scoop up uh, some material, look at it. Uh, get our first taste, if you will, of what might be under that ice crust. And that will really inform us as to what we might do next. Thank you. Okay, last question from the audience. So I was wondering, so like those, um, the craters, the really big craters that dis from the asteroids that distorted the shape of the uh, Vestas, I was wondering how big were they? Where do you think they come from, and what happened to them? Uh, so the, the two large craters in the southern hemisphere, Vesta Rea, Silvia, and Venonea, um, were caused by asteroids impacts that were probably um, about 60 kilometer diameter for Rea, Silvia, and, and probably on the order of 50 for the Venonea impact. And, it, it, you know, Vesta itself, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just talking in, in metrics here, but <laughs> I'm going to stick with that. Um, Vesta is about 530 um, 
kilometers in diameter at the equator. So 60, a 60 kilometer object is very large relative to the size of Vesta. So that's why it, it created uh, a, a basin that was almost the, the diameter of the body. So, the, so that's the sizes. We, we also know if you, you think about the size of Vesta and the size of this impactor, um, most of the craters we see on the Earth and Mars look very, um, they're kind of simple bowl shapes because the, the impact is coming in largely vertically or at some you know, small angle. But for a, such a small object being, being hit by this um, much larger object, um, it's, it's sort of by nature going to have an angle to it. And we think in particular the Venenea impact came in and kind of um, plowed into Vesta at, at a steep angle or, or a shallow, I should say shallow angle. And so that like pushed um, material and, and spread it around on the surface and, and including part of the impactor. So these bodies that slammed into Vesta came uh, from the main belt um, most likely, that's because the flux of material that, um, that was hitting bodies in the main belt was coming mainly from the, the local neighborhood. And as such, the velocities are not very different. And so one of the big differences between impact uh, processes on small bodies like um, Vesta and Ceres, or larger small bodies, and, um, and planets is that the impact speeds are fairly low. So we have to kind of um, rethink the um, the, the process itself and, and what, um, what, how it manifests in terms of the geology of the body. Um, but this one last thing I want to say is the impactor um, that created the Venonea Basin looks like it brought a lot of this dark carbon rich material. Um, so we, we can kind of look back and, and say something about the nature of that body based on the, the material, the debris field that we see on the surface. Um, we don't know anything really about the Rhea Silvia impactor because we don't see anything uh, particularly unusual in its ejecta. Mm -hmm. So also in the Rhea Silvia, I see there's like a big bump in the middle. In the middle, yeah. yeah. So that's called a central mound. And um, af once you get to a certain diameter, uh, a, a large enough impact, will depress the surface of the body to such an extent that um, there's a, a, a rebound effect. So you can think of it as, you know, you're, you're, you're pressing, the material actually has a bit of ductility, it can, it can flow, and then um, and it's being heated by the impact <coughs> itself. And so um, the response, once that transient crater is, is created, is that some material can flow back in and it kind of um, comes up like a, like a a big drop that you see when you, you drop something into water. So it's coming back and then it freezes into place there in the middle. I think there's a rule of thumb planetary scientists use, and Dante, correct me if I'm not right, and that is if you have a, um, a, an object that's a mile in size and it hits another object in space, it's gonna create a hole, a crater that's 10 times its size. So okay. it's a 10 to one ratio. It's a good rule of thumb. Okay, so I'm gonna to move to taking some questions from online, but uh, panel, please remember that the questions are coming from the audience, so please address your answers to the audience as well. So the first one is uh, a question from Ustream um, for Alan. Is it surprising that Pluto has a polar cap and will New Horizons be able to tell the temperature difference between the pole and the equator? Okay, so uh, uh, it's, it's um, uh, it's not necessarily surprising that Pluto has a polar cap. Hubble images that were made uh, years ago indicated that there, there might be such a polar cap. Seeing it up close with New Horizons is confirmatory. Uh, but the last step to really know that it's a polar cap and not just a pro polar bright thing is to determine the composition of this material. And we have to be much closer than we are now. We're still 60 million kilometers from the planet. Now, uh, the other part of the question uh, really, really wanted to focus on on uh, whether you know knowing that there's a polar cap has has something to teach us about about the planet more generally. And in fact, uh, climate models that have been done for Pluto um, uh, predict that the, whether or not there's a polar cap helps you distinguish between whether or not the atmosphere can permanently collapse 
or not as Pluto moves around its orbit with the sun. And so the presence of this putative polar cap, if confirmed by compositional spectroscopy, which we will be able to start in late June, um, could rule out a whole class of, of uh, climate models. And uh, I know the scientists that work on that, like Leslie Young, are pretty excited about this possibility. So the other thing that we can do when we get closer is to look at that material, if it is in fact a polar cap, and look for whether there are geological features in it like the Mars polar terrains, the layered terrains on the polar caps of Mars, because that could teach us, it could actually show us the history of deposition and, and retreat of snows and atmospheric um, cycles over billions of years on the surface of Pluto and let us basically read the history of it. So having a, a strong smoking gun on approach that there is a polar cap is getting us excited from the climate standpoint, from the atmospheric standpoint, from the geologic standpoint. Um, and my team's pretty excited. Okay, we have a, a question for Claudia from the Ustream audience. Is there any chance that Philae is going to wake up and that the drill will be able to take samples? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate? <laughs> so, um, so we do think that Philly has been receiving about an hour of sunlight per day, which, as you know, is if you have your phone and it's in the red zone and you don't give it enough charge, it doesn't come out of that red zone. Uh, so when we, as we get closer to the sun, we should be getting about four hours of sunlight per day. We have a very convenient cliff overhanging us called the perihelion cliff. We call it that because that's supposed to help us get to perihelion without having the electronics fry, as was originally thought we would get about to march, and then it would become too hot, hot at the original landing site to uh, operate the, the, uh, the Philly lander because the electronics wouldn't work anymore. So we're in this incredibly great, cool place, um, and also we expect to get enough sunlight to, uh, to um, wake up and communicate with Philly. And then the question is, are we, I'm sure we'll be able to operate some of the instruments, but some of the key, we had a, a, a drill that was supposed to put material into ovens that were gonna rotate into their sniffers and we were gonna be able to really do some mass spectrometry uh, to figure out what the material was made of. And it's not clear that we're oriented in the right place to get that drill to actually get material from the surface. We think we might be a little bit uh, too high up. So um, first we wanna uh, get some signals back, wake it up, and then we'll figure out, you know, then at that point, uh, how to make the instruments go through their paces to figure out uh, what experiments we'll be able to pick up with. Okay, here's a question for Dante. A Ustream audience member wants to know which type of meteorite is closest to Bennu? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and I mentioned during uh, an earlier discussion that we're having a tough time linking Bennu to any known meteorites. It does look like some other interesting asteroids and even some extinct comets in the solar system. For example, there's this object we call Wilson-Harrington, which was an active comet when it was first discovered in the 1950s and has since gone extinct. It has a very similar spectral signature to Bennu. We also have these interesting objects called main belt comets, which seem like they're activating uh, when they get close to their perihelion. We're not sure if they're impacts or dust plumes or if it's cometary activity, but they're the same B type of asteroid. We did have a, one of our science team members, Beth Clark, go through a very thorough spectral study, and the closest analog she, she could find was what's called a CM chondrite of petrologic type one. It's an incredibly rare type of meteorite. There's only two or three of them known on Earth. Uh, one classic example is called Tagish Lake, which fell in uh, Canada and has some parts of the meteorite that look like this. And that's one of these ones that was very fortuitous. It was a very friable type of sample. It, it fell apart uh, over an, a frozen lake in, in Canada, and somebody had the, the wits about them to gather it and freeze it, so we have some of that material. And something like that is our closest analog right now. But there's just some spectral features, particularly the fact that it doesn't get dimmer in the ultraviolet. Bennu continues to get brighter, uh, and it doesn't have what we call this UV drop-off feature, and we're not sure what's going on there. So that's one of the reasons it's chosen as our target. It really looks different and interesting, and we'll find out. It's one of the key science objectives. Is it linked to any known meteorites, or is it a new type of material? Okay, a question for Carol from Twitter is, how do the bright spots change in brightness as Ceres spins? 
How are the changing? How, how do the bright spots on series change as you watch series rotate? Okay. Um, so basically, they they don't uh, change in brightness in any unexpected way. Um, obviously, as they're coming into sunlight, um, they, they grow in intensity because um, they are reflective materials. So if the sun is straight, pointing straight at the surface where the um, spot is, it's more reflective than um, when it's going into the shadow of the terminator. So we don't see any evidence that the material is, um, that, that there's, there's anything above the surface. I said we don't see any evidence yet that there's any material above the surface that we can discern. Um, if, if you look at series in forward scattered light, um, which the sun is behind, and we're looking at the illumination of um, you know, any dust or um, material that's coming out of the surface. We've done that observation, and um, we're not seeing anything obvious. So um, we don't have any evidence yet that there's changes that are not expected relative to the illumination conditions. Okay, I'll take one more question from the audience. For a series in Vesta, how do they compare to other objects in the asteroid belt, and, and what can findings about them tell us about the rest of typical objects in the asteroid belt? Um, yeah, so Mark described pretty well uh, uh, at the beginning that um, you know, series and Vesta are quite different than most objects in the main belt, um, and series in particular uh, bears more affinity to um, uh, Kuiper Belt objects, icy moons, Pluto, um, than it does to the uh, kind of collisional debris that is the, um, the, the majority of objects in the main belt. But of course, as I, I said before, the mass-wise, Vesta and Ceres are most of the mass. And, and that's, to me, that's one of the most remarkable things is that these two objects clearly are um, the, the fossils left over from a time when there was many uh, protoplanets and, and larger planetesimals that were the building blocks of, of the planets that we're seeing today, and they're, they're gone. They've, they either got merged into planets or they got disrupted um, into fragments. And so by being able to um, look at these um, basically uh, inf infants from the early solar system, these baby planets that did not get destroyed, um, they, they tell us about the elemental distribution of material in the solar nebula. They tell us about the processes which were going on that was changing that material before it became part of the planets. And that, that's kind of the, the critical thing. Is when you look at Vesta, it's, it's depleted in some of the, the light elements. Um, it's depleted in potassium. And we believe that's, uh, and, and sodium, and that's the result of the um, particular environment in the nebula in which it formed. Um, and then we look at series, and we haven't gotten the data yet, but it, it will also give us this kind of, um, you know, elemental fingerprint of what the environment was like um, in the environment we think series formed in, which is the outer main belt. So we're trying to inform the, um, the distribution of material and then how it was processed before it was, um, before it came together to form planets. And I'll add a little bit to that. One class of asteroids that we think is linked to Vesta, we call the V type of asteroids or the Vestoids. And these actually look like chunks of Vesta that were, were thrown off in, in the, one of those giant collisions, probably the, the most recent one. And th this was another reason we were able to link the HED meteorites to Vesta, because not only did they look the same spectrally, but we could see a little trail, almost a trail of breadcrumbs that were going from Vesta dynamically. Some of them could get into Earth-crossing orbits and get delivered there. So it gave us a good understanding of the origin of the Vesta family and some of even V-type asteroids in the near-Earth object population. Everybody likes your question, so I'll chip in, too. <laughs> um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a small but growing uh, conversation in the planetary science community uh, championed by, uh, by some planetary astronomers that a series actually uh, bears a lot of resemblance to some of the small planets in the Kuiper belt and that it actually may have originated there. So Ceres, we'll see what Don has to teach us, may, may actually be more related to Kuiper belt objects, big ones like Pluto, uh, than to smaller asteroids where it orbits now. Mm -hmm. We'll see. 
Okay, this will be the last audience question that we take. Okay, I have two unrelated questions. Uh, the first one, in regards to uh, the concern about the density of the material that's being ejected from the comets, that you said that you're wondrous about the density of the material. Does uh, Newton's dirty little secret where he didn't have an exact uh, ability to predict a comet's trajectory, uh, does the amount of deviation from the projected trajectory give you a hint as to the density of the ejecta that you were seeking? So uh, comets are very low density objects, extremely do low density, highly porous. Um, so when I said that it's a, trying to figure out if the, this is really a jet has to do with the mass of what's coming out, um, it's, it's really what I meant was that, uh, you know, these so-called jets are obvious once you stretch the picture a million times, uh, but, they're, but they're very ten tenuous. Uh, so the density of the, of the dust that's coming out that we've collected so far is pretty much in keeping with the low density, bulk density that we have also discovered with this particular comet. And everything we know about other comets is they are also very low density. So that is not, uh, it, it's, th the trajectory of what's coming out is not necessarily related to the, to the density of, this, of these things that we're collecting that are coming off of the surface. Well, no, I, what I meant was the trajectory of the comet as a whole, because Newton couldn't predict the exact trajectory of a comet, and it was later figured out or presumed to be correct uh, with evidence that it was the uh, ejecta from the comet that was acting like a reactionary rocket and, and making for the, uh, the, the indiscretion. That the, 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 the so-called jet, yeah. it was like a jet engine yes. that was changing the trajectory of the comet. Right. No, I'm very dubious about that particular notion. Again, I think that the, the jets are enough to, the so-called jet, plume-like material is enough to maybe affect the torque of the body itself. But to actually change the tra trajectory of the body, um, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's exactly what that, that gaseous, plumy stuff that comes out. It, it's coming out all over, OK? It, there's no particular directionality that we know of. And I, I, I believe that the torque we're seeing all sorts of different ways in which the body adjusts to the forces that are on it. Uh, but to actually change the trajectory has more, the trajectory does change of comets. The, our comet has had uh, a slightly different trajectory than the previous apparition. But um, those are, there's, a, there's the gravitational influences of everything from the Jupiter and the other planets to basically the tides, the galactic tides that are within the Milky Way. Okay, other uh, 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 nebulae and, the, and, the, and as the, the solar system moves through. So there's a lot of influences that will orbitally disrupt what uh, a comet is doing. And I am dubious about the actual stuff that comes out being a significant player in that. So, so the okay, so we're going to have to move on from, from this particular question and ask one final question mm -hmm. of the panel and then wrap up this, uh, this wonderful discussion here. With, with all of these missions that are represented on the panel, we have two that have been flying for long enough to gather science data uh, that we've had on the ground for long enough that papers have started being published. And we have one that is just barely beginning to get your prime science mission back and one that hasn't even launched yet. So I'm wondering if our more... Uh, experienced mission scientists who have, after all, uh, enjoyed the, uh, the human challenge of operating a science mission and getting all the science out there, if you have any advice to offer the scientists who have not quite yet there at their science missions at their primary targets, what have you learned that you would like to tell them? Prepare well, for the unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think, I think everyone, we go to these uh, scenes and we are prepared to be, to have our theories knocked, uh, knocked over. Uh, you know, we are prepared for completely new, uh, that's, that's partly why we're there. Um, I think for me, the idea that we could quickly turn around great new theories and that we would solve problems rapidly um, is just, I'm just have 
different expectations than what is real, okay? Uh, we, there, you have your discovery kind of, you know, we discovered the deuterium to hydrogen ratio and that had an immediate implication. But to actually process and, and uh, internalize and understand uh, a lot more results, it requires really understanding your instrument performance, which changes with time. Uh, um, you know, it's just, it turns out not to be as fast. And I think even the public has to understand that it's, it's, um, it's not so easy to get some of these results out uh, and that everybody needs more time to understand what the implications of everything that they're seeing. Yeah, I'd like to chip something in. Um, New Horizons is the 26th space mission that I've been involved in. <laughs> and, and I can tell you from the others uh, that it's always worth the wait. Uh, and that's partially because um, at NASA, uh, we, we have this tremendous technology that we developed to bring these tremendous sensor suites, uh, or in some cases to bring uh, the samples back um, that can illuminate our thinking. But also, it, that's even further reinforced by the fact that nature just always outsmarts us. It's always more complicated. Uh, in hindsight, it may be obvious, but oftentimes what we find is not what we expected to find. And that kind of discovery, like riverbeds on Mars or volcanoes on Io or oceans on the inside of so many worlds in the outer solar system, is the best part. It's always worth the wait. Okay. Carol? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll add to those comments. Um, uh, clearly, it's, it's, a, it's a wild ride. It's so exciting. Um, and the, the collaboration that goes on within a mission team when you're looking at a world for the first time and trying to figure it all out, um, it's truly inspiring. Um, and, and it is very difficult to, to make sense of it because if it were easy, we probably wouldn't go there. So I, I would say that um, one thing to keep in mind for anybody who's involved in one of these missions is, is to really uh, soak in the, the historical significance or the, the human significance of the moment of, of going somewhere and finding out things for the first time and turn it around and make sure that people like you, the audience, can share in the experience because if, if we don't you know, bring that knowledge out into the world in a compelling way, then we haven't done our job. And I'd just like to add, first of all, thanks. I'm very much looking forward to getting into operations and getting to that first look at Bennu and, and starting to really think about where we're going to get the sample. But I also want to point out that this, it's a really great community to be a part of because um, this isn't the first advice I've gotten from Rosetta. And it's not the first advice I've gotten from Don. Both missions have been very open with us. We have requested to go out visit their operations centers. We've talked to the team here in Pasadena that's operating the Dawn spacecraft about the challenges they faced. We've gone out to uh, Darmstadt, Germany, and to Toulouse, France, and we talked to the teams that did site selection for the Filet lander and operated the spacecraft around the comet, and they've always welcomed us with open arms and really given us a lot of great advice, which has turned into very practical planning for us. So it's, there's a real sense of camaraderie, and Alan from day one has said, you know, gave me his phone number, and I've used it to give him a call and say, hey, I'm struggling with this, that, or the other thing on the program. Did you come across similar things? What do you recommend? And so he's been a really great uh, colleague to have. And many other people, Bruce Chikoski, Scott Bolton, uh, that are running MAVEN and Juno and uh, other missions, they've always you know, given me the, the opportunity to come and bounce ideas off of them and support each other. So I just want to thank you all very much. I want to remind everybody that even though there's, these are all robotic space exploration missions that we've been talking about, they're robotic missions that are flown by teams of thousands of humans doing the work behind the scenes. These uh, five people up here are just the tip of the iceberg of a tremendous community of scientists, engineers, managers, computer programmers, all kinds of humans contributing to this grand exploration. And I thank you all for your very hard work and for sharing it all with the rest of us. And Godspeed, good luck to all of your missions. Thank, thank you very much, Emily.